Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk you through my top five PowerPoint hacks. Actually, I'm going to talk you through quite a bit more than that because I'm a little bit of a PowerPoint and graphic design dork. Um, so for example, I'll be sprinkling in things like notice how this slide utilizes the concept of symmetry. Right? All of my text and my images are centered. We have 2.5 flowers on the left side and 2.5 flowers on the right side. These are some really simple things that will just help you make your PowerPoints look prettier. There's also an even subtler hack in here, which is that you probably can't tell that the title and the byline are actually slightly different color fonts. Maybe if you have a good screen and you look really close, you can tell, but the byline is actually slightly darker. And the reason for that is that when your text is smaller, you need it to be even more high contrast, so the difference in brightness between the background and the font, um, in order for it to be legible to a viewer. So the gray that I used in that byline is actually just slightly darker than the one I used in my title, because the font is smaller, so it needs to be higher contrast for it to be as visible to the viewer. So just some little things like that that we'll talk about as we go through. But what are the five hacks? Okay, the five hacks are the slide master view, which I'll show you here in just a second, using high quality open source images. I like Unsplash uh, online. It's free and completely easy to use, and I'll show you it in just a second as well. The eyedropper technique, which I've actually used to create this slide, and then PowerPoint shapes, which I'll talk about two different ways to use them uh, in order to make your slides look more attractive visually and also as a sort of rhetorical tool to emphasize a part of an image or text on your slide. So I'll walk you through all of those. So in order to show you Slide Master View, I actually have to get out of presenter mode. So the way that you use Slide Master View is I recommend doing this right when you start any uh, PowerPoint presentation at all. I did it when I before I started making this one. It should be your first step because what it allows you to do is it allows you to change the font, colors, and format of every single slide. So that way you don't have to change every single one individually. So you know when you open a PowerPoint, usually the default is a white background, black text, usually in Calibri or Arial or you know some other very common font. Um, and say you don't want that. Say you want a different color. For example, I really like dark backgrounds to my PowerPoints. Um, then using Slide Master View allows you to change all of your slides at one time so you don't have to change it individually on each one. So to, in order to get to Slide Master View, you just go to View, Master, Slide Master. Click on that. Boop. And then what you'll see is a slide in every single format that PowerPoint gives you right off the bat. So in order to change all your slides across every format, you click this top one, and then, for example, you could go to background styles and choose a background either from one of the presets or from the format background menu, right? So here I could set a picture, change the color, things like that. You can also change the fonts. Here I've selected, you can see I've already done that. I've selected Garamond, which is undeniably the pumpkin spice latte of font crushes, but what can I say? This is who I am. I've accepted it. So you have all these font combinations that you can choose from, right? Um, so that you can pick the font that you want to show up on every single slide. Obviously this Calibri is the default, and then you can go from there. So this slide master hack, will help you just save time and choose the sort of basic layout you want for all your slides so you don't have to change each one individually, okay? So when I've got my presets the way I want, I can either close Slide Master or I can go back to View, Normal. And here we are back at my first slide, all right? So that's the very first hack. The second hack is to use high quality open source images. The number one way to kill a PowerPoint Presentation is to use, you know, whatever the top five results were from a Google image search. They often are, the files aren't big enough, so when you put them in your PowerPoint, especially if you have to project them, they're really grainy. Uh, maybe they have a watermark on them. They're not particularly good images to begin with, right? Um, so I recommend using a website called Unsplash, which is right here. It's just unsplash.com and it is a searchable database of professional grade photographs. So for example, to get the daisy photo that I use on the first slide, I wanted something to do with five because we're talking about the five hacks. So here I've got a whole bunch of photos coming up. I didn't really like these. Obviously I used this one on the second slide. Here's the one I used for the first slide. So on Unsplash, 
there are a couple fun options. So if I click this little plus sign, I can add it to a collection. Now this is because I've created a free Unsplash account, which you can do for absolutely no charge. You just create an account and it allows you to create these different collections of photographs that you store up. So for example, oftentimes is one of the first things I do when I'm making a visual project, whether that's a PowerPoint or a video, I create a new collection on Unsplash. You can just create a new collection and I can add a bunch of photos that I want to use in the project to that folder so that instead of having to search through all the time, I just have those photos always. In fact, I even do this when I create my icon sites um, in order to give the icon site a kind of unified feel for my courses. All right, so I could save that photo to a collection. The other thing that I can do is by clicking on the photo and clicking on this little down arrow, I can decide what size of photo I want to download. This doesn't seem that important, but it, I actually find it to be very useful. So by default, um, Unsplash will download usually the large Im version of the photo. That's good because it's a high quality image. The problem is if you use a lot of them in one PowerPoint, for example, the file becomes huge and it's really hard to do anything with it. It's really hard to attach it to an email, for example. So I actually like to go for the medium size. It's big enough that you, know, you can still project it on a pretty large screen and it'll look just fine, um, but not so large that it's gonna create this really unwieldy file. So I hit medium and then it downloads straight to my computer. And obviously it'll be in my downloads file as well. And from here I can drag and drop this image into my PowerPoint or insert the image, you know, as you normally would in a PowerPoint by doing insert image from file. So that's Unsplash and it is super, super useful. It also, if you wanna be a good digital citizen, gives you the name of the creator so that you can give them credit, um, which is also just good digital citizenship practice. Okay. Back to our hacks. The next hack is the eyedropper technique, which I used to create this slide. The eyedropper technique allows you to pull an image from anywhere on your screen and use it for your font or your background. So for example, say I wanted to go to change the font, or change, excuse me, the background uh, color. I would go to design, format background, and then if I hit this little down arrow next to the color icon and hit more colors, there's this little handy dandy eyedropper. Whoop. And then wherever I scroll over, I can select that color in order to be the new background for my slide. And it doesn't even have to just be things in, um, in the slide itself. I can even pick colors from you know, the background of my computer or PowerPoint itself. You can get wild with this. Um, but what it does is, especially if you draw a color from an image that you're using in your slide, it creates a sense of continuity. So for example, if I draw a blue from here, see, um, the blue I'd drawn was also already from the image, but this just gives a slightly different feel um, and gives you a sense of unity between the image and the rest of the slide. So I highly recommend always using the eyedropper technique for your colors because it will give your uh, slides a really original feeling because you're not using any of the sort of canned preset um, color menus or options that PowerPoint already has. So it'll make your slides feel original, more creative, and more dynamic. Um, okay, so that's the eyedropper technique. The next one is shapes used two ways. So we've got shapes used for graphic design and shapes used for emphasis. This is one of my favorite PowerPoint hacks, maybe the top one. So here's a slide that I created. I'll do PowerPoint or presenter mode so you can kind of see. Here's a slide I created to be the cover slide for a presentation I did this morning. And you can see that basically it's just an image and text. But what takes this slide to the next level is this shape, this gray triangle that I put in the bottom. So how did I do that? Um, I can delete that out of here. Boop. And you can see that the problem with this slide, it's fine, but the text is really hard to read because we've got that sort of dirty snow in the background. It doesn't have enough contrast with the text in order for someone to be able to really read it easily, especially at a distance. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go insert shapes. And I spent quite a bit of time playing around with what shape I wanted, but I eventually chose the right, tri right triangle um, in order to mimic the slope of this mountain in the image. So I'm gonna insert that shape, and the first thing I'm gonna do is rotate it. So you see this little, sort of looks like a spinning arrow up at the top. I'm gonna use that to rotate it, whoops. And then I'm going to use these very normal familiar sliders 
to manipulate the exact dimensions of the triangle here. I'm going to try to get it so that the line of the triangle is roughly parallel with the line of the mountain because that's aesthetically pleasing. Um, then I'm going to change the color. I'm going to choose a pretty, you know, typical gray. We don't need to do anything super fancy. Um, also, you'll, if you can see there, there's a slight blue outline. For some reason, that is the default. So I always go up here and select no outline. Just makes it look cleaner. And then I want it to be a little transparent so it's not quite as harsh. And you can see that right now the, the text is still behind the shape. So in order to fix that, all I do is go right click, send to back. And if I send it all the way backwards, I think it's going to be behind my image. So I'm going to go send to back. Oops, that's exactly what I said I didn't want to do. Control Z. Um, I'm going to go send backward. Now part of my text is over top of it. If I do that one more time, there we are. That's what I want. Um, and now I might adjust the transparency even a little more. There, that's really nice. Um, so you can see that this allows you to just add an extra element to your slides to make them feel more original and creative um, and just adds some more interest, really opens up the possibility of how you can integrate text and image in any particular slide. So that's how you use shapes for graphic design purposes. You can also put in lines to create frames around things using the exact same method. Um, okay, back to presenter mode. How do you use shapes for emphasis? So this is particularly pertinent to rhetoric classes. So here is a bit of text from uh, W.G. Sebald's novel, Austerlitz. This is a slide that I made for a presentation while I was working on my MFA about um, Sebald's prose style. And so what I did is I took this section of text from Austerlitz and I used shapes to highlight various elements of Sebald's prose. So for example, when these green squares pop up, they um, highlight verb phrases, right? Um, and we can actually sort of see there if you skim through that Sebald doesn't put a lot of emphasis on his verb phrases in his prose style. Um, a lot of them are in passive voice, are to be verbs. Um, None of them are super active or dynamic verbs that give us a lot of sort of oomph in the prose style. Um, Sebald's verbs tend to recede into the background. Then the purple highlights his, some of his noun phrases, which by contrast are incredibly evocative and dynamic. And then finally, the blue or highlights his um, subordinating conjunctions, which point, allow Sebald to spin this incredibly ornate sentence structure. Um, so how did I make this slide? Well, it took me a little bit of time. I'm not going to lie to you. And when it's not in presenter mode, it looks like this. It looks kind of a mess. Um, but what I did essentially was I just did um, insert, whoops, go here instead, insert shapes. And I just selected the square and formatted it. Now, I only did it that way once because once I had one that was about the right dimensions, um, I just copy and pasted over and over and over again um, and then made small adjustments. Now you're already noticing that I'm actually having trouble clicking on the shapes because, micro, or because PowerPoint keeps thinking that I want to click on the text. So a little hack while I was editing this, I actually cheated and sent this to the back. Send to back, there we go. So now we've got all my squares on top. This made it just a lot easier to uh, manipulate where my little squares were. Now, the other really important thing about this is that you saw that I had all those animations. It would be a pain in the butt to animate each of those little squares individually. So how did I get around it? Well, what I did was there is a keystroke on Mac and also on PC that allows you to select multiple things at once. On a Mac, it's if you hold down the command key and then I can select, for example, all the blue squares. See, now all the blue squares are, um, squares are connected, cl <laughs> are clicked, they're selected, excuse me, and so I can hit one of these effects to make them do what I want. Right? Um, so that was how I got around it, because I knew with absolute certainty that I did not want to animate each of those little squares 
individually because it would take for gosh darn ever. So let me just bring this back to the front. There we are. All right. So that is one way to use shapes to highlight portions of a text if you're doing, per se, rhetorical analysis. Yeah. Um, as another example, here is a image taken from social media. This is a screenshot, um, obviously, of text that I also wanted to analyze in a demonstration of video essay that I was creating. And in this, I wanted to highlight um, the uh, consistent use of and as a rhetorical strategy throughout this tweet. So I use shapes to highlight all the ands in this image. And once again, that was really easy to do. All it took was insert shapes I selected this open circle. Say we wanted to highlight this word. Put a shape in. This uh, yellow square in the center allows you to adjust the width. And then these allow you to adjust the size. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Here we go. All right, so now I can highlight that word. And I changed the color the exact same way that I've been showing you the previous times. All right, um, so there we have it. Those are my top five PowerPoint hacks with a couple of extras thrown in on just some of my other favorite nerdy PowerPoint techniques. I hope that was helpful. Talk to y'all soon.